Okay, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking basically for the short time frame, I'm just going to do kind of like a little PSA for higher symmetries and their spontaneous symmetry. Okay, so first, I have to tell you what a higher symmetry is. So uh, if we have a theory that comes equipped with some like a conserved p dimensional objects, then we say it has a p form higher symmetry. So for example, like a, in this language, a regular symmetry that we're familiar with would be a, a zero form higher symmetry because the operators that are usually charged under a regular symmetry are just local point like operators, right? So we might imagine this, this kind of picture. We have uh, some local operators that carry the charge under the symmetry, and if I want to count uh, how many of these guys I have, I take some co dimension one surface that I might get by like, integrating a current, and I like sweep it around, and whenever it passes one of these uh, charged local operators, it acts on them with some symmetry. Okay, so if I wanted to do, talk about something that has a one-form symmetry, then I would have some like conserved. Uh, I would have some good, a conserved number of like one-dimensional strings. Uh, so in this example, they would be the blue strings. And if I want to detect them, then I take a charge operator that's supported on a line, and as I drag this charge operator around, when it passes through the other strings, it acts on them with some symmetry. Okay, so if I had some like. Uh, fields in mind, like a prototypical thing that a regular symmetry would do is it would like shift this field by a constant, for example. And uh, a prototypical thing that a one-form symmetry could do is if I have like a gauge theory in mind, it would take the, a gauge field and shift it by a flat connection. Uh, so this is a, a global symmetry, not a gauge symmetry, because you can't shift something by a flat connection. And then, yeah, so two-form symmetries that have surfaces. Three form symmetries, volumes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So why why is thinking about the why are thinking about these things useful? Well, anything you can do with a regular symmetry, you can do with a higher symmetry. So uh, you can gauge them. They can have anomalies. There can be like associated LSM theorems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you have stuff like magneto hydrodynamics, where you naturally have some like conserved magnetic fluxes that are moving around, or elasticity theory, where you have some like, uh, conserved one dimensional dynamical defects, then Thinking about them in kind of like a symmetry-based way is useful for thinking about uh, effective field theories. And then what, why, why I thought these were cool at first is that you can, you can kind of like do Landau symmetry breaking uh, analysis for higher symmetries. And a lot of the things that you thought uh, really didn't involve symmetry breaking actually do involve symmetry breaking, but the symmetry involved is one of these higher symmetries. Okay, so of course, uh, they can be spontaneously broken. So uh, if I have a p-form symmetry that gets spontaneously broken, then we, we have some operator that's inserting one of these p-dimensional things, and it gets embedded. So uh, the left-hand picture would be, I have a one-form one symmetry, so I have these one-dimensional uh, one conserved things. The left picture is the symmetric phase. And in the right picture, the operator that inserts one of these strings gets embedded. So I have this like string net condensate uh, going on. So of course, like an example would be you know, the torque. So our code is the right-hand side, right-hand side picture, where I have like a, these strings have a Z2 character, uh, yeah. And also, I should be clear by the picture. If I if I'm thinking of like a gauge theory context, then the symmetry broken phase would be the deconfined phase of the gauge theory, and the symmetric phase would be the confining phase of the gauge theory. Okay. They also have a, a Goldstone theorem accordingly. So. Namely, if you spontaneously break them and are continuous, you get Goldstone modes. Uh, proof is, is straightforward. Uh, what, one thing that simplifies things is that if you have, uh, if the charge objects are greater than zero dimensional, then the algebra of the charge operators is abelian, just by the way that they kind of like get formed around. And so, if they get broken, I have a Goldstone, and I just have an abelian symmetry. Then, uh, if I go to the deep IR. Then the only action I can really write down is this like free term for the Goldstone, so it's just like generalized Maxwell term. So this makes things. Sorry, the, 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 the traditional Goldstone theorem also tells us how many Goldstone modes are there. Yeah. <coughs> so does this do the same thing? It can tell us how many photons are there? Yeah, I mean there might be some like uh, subtleties if like the symmetries involved play with space time or something, uh, or you can have like less Goldstone modes than you expect. I'm not sure what happens, in the case, but. Uh, but if, if, if I, th I think we don't consider, like, if space-time symmetries don't get mixed in, I think it's, it's one Goldstone. Okay. Uh, modulo, you can have things where you have, like, two symmetries that look different, but they have, like, a mixed anomaly and stuff, and you only get one Goldstone. And also, Goldstone theorem is for continuous global symmetry. 
Yeah, yeah. So here you have a, like, it's, it's yeah, a continuous, continuous form. form. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah, if I break us, if I spontaneously break a discrete symmetry, then, okay. then I'm not going to get the last symmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also you, on your pre previous slide, you said that the deconfined phase is a uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking phase, the one form symmetry, and the confined phase is a symmetric phase. That's so right. what about something like a like a bank stack fixed point or something like that. Like oh, what is this one? It's a strongly impacting matter, gauge field, couple, or fixed point. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, what usually, I'm seeing, usually the, these higher symmetries, you only have them in like pure gauge theories. So. Only pure gauge theories. Yeah. Uh, if you have matter, you don't no, no matter. You have to add matter in some like special multiples of charts. Okay. I, I see. I see. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then also accordingly, you, you can talk about when they can be spontaneously broken. So, if we have a continuous, again, uh, p form symmetry, so the charge objects are p dimensional, then if the dimension of the charge objects is dimension of space time minus two, then you can't have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So, for example, I mean, there, there are many ways to see this, but like to kind of convince you, suppose we're in like uh, three dimensions and we have a one form symmetry. So, for example, we have like U1 gauge theory in three dimensions. So the charge objects are the Wilson lines. So I just want to ask if the Wilson line can get it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert this blue Wilson line. So the top and bottom slabs are identified. So I'm wrapping some cycle here. And I just want to say, ask if that gets a bev. Well, I can calculate the bev kind of like, one way to do it is say, well, I'm in three dimensions. I have a gauge field. I can dualize it to a scalar. The insertion of the Wilson line becomes a two pi vortex for the scalar. So then if I want to ask what the now that this Wilson line is, well, it has, okay, it has the coupling, it has the length of the line, and then the energy of a two-point vertex for a scalar in two dimensions has this like logarithmic divergence. So I just insert that in there. Here, R is the size of the slab. And I see that when I take the slab to, to take the thermodynamic limit, this goes to zero. So basically saying that you can't have a non-zero bed for this thing. Does it just mean the gauge theory of all base confining? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, as you're kind of are anticipating, one thing we know is that like, uh, you know, Polykov has this famous thing where he shows that in three dimensions, pure U on gauge theory is confining. Uh, and so that's really just a special case of this Merman one here, you know, talking about the symmetry being spontaneously broken or not. So it, it appears, you know, so everything goes through when you're on a lattice and you have monopoles and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, there's, of course, there's a, there's a similar result for discrete symmetries. Like in the case of uh, normal symmetries, you just shift the crystal dimension by one. So if the dimension of your charged objects is one less than the dimension of space time, then you can't get a bit. And then, yeah, so finishing up just things that I would like to learn more about. So uh, this kind of like framework might be useful to keep in mind when you talk about stuff with subsystem symmetries or kind of like uh, kind of field theory models of elasticity theory and fractons. Uh, here, the charge operator are topological, and these theories are not, but they're kind of similarities. Uh, they might have something useful to say about asymptotic symmetries. This is kind of a high energy thing. And then, yeah, well, one thing I would like to know more about, I think I probably just need to read more on the literature about con uh, confinement phase transitions, but uh, you know, what, what kind of phase transitions can you have that involve these kind of symmetries? Like, it seems you can have uh, some like higher versions of BKT transitions stuff, and I'd like to learn more about this. Anyway, uh, I'll stop there and thanks for listening. I think generally um, microscopic Hamilton don't have higher form symmetries, but it seems like often they can be emergent somehow. Can you share anything on that? Yeah, usually because you need, usually because these are coming up in some case where you have a huge theory. Like you want the you want the symmetry you want you want to have symmetries that kind of like involve uh, like flat connections or higher versions thereof. So you are kind of like you want to get rid of all the local you want to get rid of any kind of like local stuff. So you, you the symmetries usually need to come from non-local things, which is why you really have a gauge theory. Yeah. Last talk in the session is Shiryan.